Thank you. That's kind. I call my talk a sea change, naval warfare in the American Revolution during the spring of 1778. And uh, as Mr. Kennedy was kind enough to point out, my purpose here tonight, or today, is to highlight the publication of volume 12. And uh, let me say, start off by saying it's difficult pushing a book that even your publisher is less than enthusiastic about. <laughs> I quote here from the blurb of the publisher, quote, this book is a key scholarly resource for a narrow group, naval and military historians and researchers of early American history and the American Revolution, who require primary source documents. Potential interests may exist with some military or revolutionary war enthusiasts. However, as you can see, Barack Obama was enthusiastic about the volume and the project. Now, unlike the publisher, which is uh, the government printing office, I think volume 12 is an important book and should enjoy a wide audience. Now, although the co period covered April and May 1778 is a small window in time, I believe a number of important changes in the nature of the naval conflict occurred during those two months. And those changes would significantly affect how the war was fought and contribute greatly to its outcome. The most important of these developments was the internationalization of the war. With the dispatch of a French fleet under the Comte de Stang from Toulon on 13 April bound for American waters. The signing of the Treaty of Alliance between France and the United States in February 1778 was obviously a major event. It was not, however, a guarantee that the French would commit naval resources to support American independence or to operate in American waters. In fact, the first request made by the American commissioners in France, that's Franklin and Adams and uh, Dean and uh, Lee, in early April, asking that the French Navy convoy and protect American merchantmen en route from France to the United States was denied by Gabriel de Sartine, the Minister of Marine. While the French leadership was unwilling to commit resources to protect American commerce, they were willing to commit their navy to assist the Americans. In a bold move, which can be credited to the triumvirate of Sartine, Sartine's assistant, the Chevalier de Fleurier, and French Foreign Secretary, the Comte de Vergennes, the French decided to send the Toulon squadron to American waters. Since the British <coughs> had few ships in the Mediterranean Sea at that time, that squadron was free to go on the offensive. At the same time, the presence of a larger French squadron at Brest, the threat of a cross-channel invasion, and concern, which was supported by intelligence, which was incorrect but on good authority, that the Spaniards were preparing to enter the war as allies of the French disquieted, and I'm quoting here, the British and forced them to keep a significant British uh, naval force off Ushant and in the English Channel and to delay sending a reinforcement under Admiral John Byron to North America. In fact, Byron first received orders to sail to America on, third, on the 3rd of May but delays and then a decision by the Lords of the Admiralty on 25 May to postpone its departure until the British Channel Fleet commander got, quote, good intelligence of Monsieur de Stang's fleet and is satisfied that it is bound to America or the West Indies, meant that the relieving fleet did not sail until the 7th of June. The time gained for the French by British indecision grew when Foul Weather Jack, and that was his nickname, Byron's fleet encountered horrific weather and was battered and scattered. Some of, them, some of them ended up back in Europe, as a matter of fact. This afforded De Stang an opportunity to arrive well before British reinforcements. However, the riskiness of sending De Stang to American waters 
shouldn't be minimized. Had the British detached Byron's reinforcements quickly, the Toulon squadron might have been trapped and defeated or maybe even lost. French planners understood, however, that the possible benefits outweighed the possible dangers and they acted decisively. Now, had the execution of this strategy been as bold as the planning, the French Navy could well have ended the war in the spring of 1778. Vice Admiral Viscount Howe's fleet in North America was badly scattered and in number of ships in the line far inferior to Destang. Moreover, the British Army abandoned Philadelphia on 18 June to move to New York City, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later. While the Army marched overland through New Jersey, that's the Battle of Monmouth if any of you know it, it shipped the bulk of its stores on merchantmen which moved slowly and in a disorganized fashion down the Delaware River to Delaware Bay and then northward to New York. Had Destang arrived earlier, he could have captured that enormous prize, crippled Howe's fleet before it had established a strong defensive position at New York, and then could have blockaded the city, the center of British power in North America. The large British garrison there depended almost entirely on supplies shipped in from elsewhere. So without resupply, it probably would have been forced to surrender. So you can see, they could have ended the war. However, this didn't happen, obviously, because the Toulon fleet was slow getting to American waters. Although it sailed on 13 April, it took more than a month for Destang to pass the Straits of Gibraltar. Documents published in Volume 12 demonstrate that adverse weather, poor sailing, faulty equipment, the need to go only as fast as the slowest sailing ship, and most importantly, Destang's decision to use the voyage as a training exercise caused the, uh, the squadron to proceed across the Atlantic at a pace that can only be described as leisurely. One of the most informative documents in Volume 12 is the station bill for Destang's flagship, the ship of the line Languedoc, which demonstrates clearly how Destang used the voyage to America to train his officers. The station bill gives not only the station of, of every officer on the ship during combat, but also detailed instructions regarding their duties, such as this. On the poop deck, Monsieur Grimaldi, ensign, as near as possible to the breastwork, will command the maneuvers, the musketry, and watch over the rapidity of the fire of the swivel guns on the poop deck, mizzen top, and main top, as well as musketry from these two tops. While the French fleet may have been better prepared as a result of this training, its slow progress across the Atlantic meant that it did not arrive at the Delaware Capes until 8 July. By that time, the chance to defeat Howe's fleet before it could collect and retreat to a strong defensive position at New York, or the chance to capture the British Army's baggage had passed. Despite this missed opportunity, the nature of the naval war had changed dramatically. Internationalization of the war meant that no longer could the British assume they had unchallenged control of American waters or even the English Channel. Another effect can be gleaned from Howe's reports to the Admiralty printed in this volume. Service in American waters was hard. British ships and crews suffered accordingly. British commanders in North America were thus put between a rock and a hard place, especially as there was no good facility for repairing ships in the Americas, although as seen in Volume 12, the British had had plans to establish one. Interestingly enough, that was in the Virginia Capes, and you know what happens when they go down there. <laughs> To rotate ships to England for refit and repair left the American fleet weak, but to keep those vessels on station, as Howe and his successors were often forced to do, reduced their effectiveness. Remember, 
One of the contributing factors in the French victory at the Battle of the Virginia Capes in 1781, which is where the war ended really, was the poor condition of the British fleet. Literally, some of their ships of line were sinking as they went into the battle. The spring of 1778 also saw a dramatic change in British naval strategy. The British de-emphasized the war in the heartland of America. As mentioned, the British abandoned Philadelphia and consolidated their forces in New York and Rhode Island, which they also later abandoned. Under the new strategy, mobile detachments would be sent from water, by water from New York to destroy American forces in detail, to raid American seaports, to keep down American privateering activity, and to support a British attempt to create and build up a self-supporting loyalist base. Thus the focus of British efforts would be in the West Indies and on the periphery of the United States. In a letter to Lord Howe of 21 March, the Lords of the Admiralty spelled out this new strategy and ordered Howe to send an expedition to St. Lucia in the West Indies to and to reinforce East and West Florida and Nova Scotia. West Florida went as far west as the Mississippi River today. <clears throat> it was a viable strategy. However, fear of invasion caused the British leadership to limit reinforcements sent to its army and navy in America. Because of this, the British were overextended and outnumbered in both the United States and the West Indies. Also, New York was a difficult position to hold, which limited the troops available for detaching. As a result, Britain for for forfeited the naval initiative in the Western Hemisphere and became increasingly reactionary. Again, another rather major development. The concentration of royal forces in American waters did open up the opportunity for British and Loyalist privateers a trend that would continue until the war's end. While Admiral Howe fought a delaying action against allowing New York to become a center for loyalist privateering activity because he feared such privateering would result in desertion from Royal Navy ships and a smaller pool from which to draw impressed sailors, he eventually had to give way. As a result, the Royal Governor, William Tryon, Tryon Palace in North Carolina is his, began issuing letters of mark and reprisal in August 1778. And the success of privateers operating out of Bermuda, St. Augustine, and especially New York, became more and more evident and saw them garner greater official support and have a greater impact on United States shipping. The Continental Navy, too, saw changes during this period. The foremost, was a dramatic reduction in its size. In the period of March to May 1778, the Continental Navy had six ships captured or destroyed. The Alfred on 6 March, the Randolph on 7 March, the Columbus on 28 March, the Virginia on 31 March, the Washington on 11 May, and the Effingham also on 11 May. Member of Congress William Ellery on 25 April wrote to a friend, Our little fleet is very much thinned. And then he listed six frigates, which were the biggest ships in the Continental Navy, that had been destroyed or captured within the last year, adding tellingly, quote, Only one hath been captured on the ocean. Those losses called into question the competence and the character of the Continental Navy's leadership, particularly its ship's commanders, and also forced a change in the role that the Continental Navy played. Unable to contest British dominance on the, in the bays and seas surrounding the major cities of the United States, American seamen were pushed to the peripheries, where they enjoyed some success, at least early in 1778. In North America, there were two areas, Nova Scotia and East Florida slash Georgia, where American vessels came to dominate in the spring of 1778, and a third, 
the Mississippi River and the West Florida coast where they could realistically hope to contest British dominance. In Nova Scotia, privateers from New England, including Rhode Island, so infested, and that's the term that were used by contemporaries, the waters of that providence, that the residents of Liverpool, Nova Scotia, voted on 1 June 1778 to dismantle the town's forts and to inform American privateersmen, quote, that if they attempted to land under arms, we should oppose them. But if they do not land, nor offer to take any vessel out of our river, we will not molest them. In Georgia, gunboats of the Georgia State Navy, and that's something a lot of people don't realize. During the American Revolution, the states had individual navies as well. It wasn't all under the continent. Gunboats of the Georgia State Navy, manned in large part by Continental soldiers, scored a dramatic victory over a force of Royal Navy and East Florida provincial vessels. To check an invasion of East Florida by the Southern Continental Army, Royal Navy Captain Thomas Jordan led a force of three vessels to St. Simon's Inlet in Georgia with the intention of destroying the galleys of the Georgia State Navy. Instead, the British squadron was soundly defeated and two of the vessels, H.M. Arm Brig Hinchinbrook and East Florida Provincial Arm Sloop Rebecca, were captured. It was a dramatic victory and gave the Americans control of the intercoastal waterway from Charleston to St. Augustine, thus threatening the very existence of the British colony of East Florida. While an active Patrick Tonin, the governor of East Florida, was able to cobble together a naval defensive force, thus mitigating the damage, and unrelated issues halted the American advance toward St. Augustine, it was nonetheless an important victory and established, at least for the short term, American dominance in those waters, and could have, if it had been exploited correctly, changed the course of the war in the American South. Another success and missed opportunity for the Americans on the periphery occurred in early 1778 along the Mississippi River. The origins of this expedition to conquer West Florida go back to the summer of 1777 when the governor of Spanish Louisiana, Don Bernardo de Galvez, Galveston is named for him, uh, received a letter from Colonel George Morgan, who was the commander at Fort Pitt, which is present-day Pittsburgh, proposing that the Americans would send an expedition against Pensacola and Mobile. Morgan asked if Galvez would provide intelligence and supply transports, artillery, powder, and provisions. Now remember, Spain's still neutral. Galvez's response was equivocal, but probably more convincing was the fact that the flotilla sent to deliver Morgan's letter returned laden with arms, ammunition, and provisions worth some $70,000. After much debate, American leaders decided to dispatch a much scaled down expedition. James Willing, uh, a captain in the Continental Army, but I think we think he was transferred to the, the Navy at that point in time, and 29 men in an armed boat appropriately named the Rattle Trap. Arriving unmolested into the heart of English territory, Willing's party captured or ravaged a number of British settlements, including Natchez, Manchac, Port Coupe, and Baton Rouge. They also captured several vessels, one of which was later turned into an American warship. At Natchez, Willing convinced the inhabitants to sign an oath of neutrality. Had the expedition continued to practice restraint, Willing might have successfully captured all of West Florida. However, the Americans began plundering those not considered friends and thus created a pool of disaffected who were instrumental in helping the British to reestablish authority. One result of the Willing Expedition was that it almost sparked a war between England and Spain. Willing's party was so too small to be viable without the help of Galvez, who extended the American raiders, and I'm quoting here, the sacred right of neutrality. 
The English saw it as, quote, aiding, assisting, abetting, entertaining, succoring His Majesty's rebellious subjects, looking upon them as a separate and distinct power from that of New England. Galvez also permitted the American agent in New Orleans, Oliver Pollock, to dispose of plunder accumulated by Willing's raiders, including 680 slaves, through a public sale in New Orleans. In a letter of 7 May to Lord George Germain, Peter Chester, royal governor of West Florida, argued that, quote, the only effectual method to redress our injuries after all other means has been tried would be to make reprisals and detain Spanish property until ample restitution has been made. Therefore, it was not a paranoid rant, but an appreciation of the situation that led a beleaguered yet determined Galvez to write his superiors on 14 April, quote, it seems that the English are plotting an attack against this city, New Orleans, in retaliation for the refuge given to the Americans and their prizes. I already have two frigates in front of the city and according to reports, an additional two or three are expected, one of which, said to be a vessel of 32 cannon, is at the mouth of the river. These frigates cannot have any other object but this town, as there is no need to move upward and no business to attend to in Manchac. Natchez and the other, uh, Manchac, Natchez, and the other English settlements given, as there is no one there. I have been informed that the commander of these frigates is a brutal man, willing to commit any kind of transgression without regard to consequence. It appears he intends to demand I turn over the Americans and their prizes, especially the commander and the officers in his party, and to open fire and destroy this city if I do not accede to his demand. His intention is clear, and your lordship knows I cannot accept such a demand, and that I should be, as in fact I am, determined to defend said Americans and their prizes, and to use all force in my disposal, although they are few for this purpose. It's a testament to the strength and will of Galvez, and to his friendship to the United States, that he was not cowed into submission by the British intimidation. As Oliver Pollock reported to Congress, on 7 May, I cannot include, conclude this important subject without giving the greatest applause to Governor Galvez for his noble spirit and behavior on this occasion. For the, though he had no batteries erected or even men to defend this place against the two ships of war, namely the Hound and the Zilf, at the same time a small sloop with 100 men in the lakes was coming against him with demands and threats, yet in this situation he laughed at their haughtiness and despised their attempts, and in short, they retained as they came, or they returned as they came. I have maintained that Galvez, if you want to uh, have a Hispanic hero in the early American Revolution, or in the American Revolution, Galvez would be a perfect uh, candidate for that. Now, I understand that there is somebody uh, that's doing a book on him, and they also are building a replica of his flagship, the Galveston, uh, in Malaga, Spain. Now, they, I think they've run out of money temporarily, but someday you may see a, a, you know, a, a, a model ship up here uh, like uh, the Larmine did uh, from uh, France with uh, Lafayette. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> that's an editorial comment beyond my ed other editorial comments. <laughs> what then ensued was an elaborate game of chicken, which went on for several months and was not resolved until Chester received a letter from Lord George Germain on 5 August forbidding him to take the, quote, rash step of seizing Spanish property or committing any act of hostility against the King of Spain or his subjects. By then, the mercurial willing had exhausted the patience of both Galvez and Pollock so that both were dedicated to getting him out of New Orleans and Spanish Louisiana as quickly as possible. Even so, it was November before Willing and a handful of his companions departed uh, from New Orleans aboard a privately owned sloop. That sloop was captured at sea. Willing was taken prisoner, assuaging to be sure some of the British anger, and he languished in British custody almost two years before his captors would permit his exchange in late 1781. While the Willing expedition boosted Galvez's reputation, it was a failure for the Americans. 
Contrary to expectations, it did not permanently open up the Mississippi River to American commerce. In fact, the river was less available for Americans after the raid than before. It also hardened sentiment in British West Florida against joining the American cause. George Rogers Clark ass assessed the expedition in a spot-on fashion. He wrote, quote, When plunder is the prevailing passion of any body of troops, whether great or small, their current country can expect but little service from them. Therefore, in West Florida, Georgia, East Florida, and in Nova Scotia, the Americans were able or were unable to transform temporary advantage into long-term success. The opportunity was fleeting. By the end of 1778, the British had reinforced both Floridas and Nova Scotia and had undertaken an offensive against Georgia. However, <clears throat> The idea that the Continental Navy could not contend for the American heartland prevailed, and following a strategy promoted by, among others, Robert Morris, the financier of the American Revolution, Americans looked to attack Britain where British strategists did not expect it or where Britain was weak. An example of the former was the activity, activity of the Continental Navy in European waters in 1778. An example of the latter was the activities of the Pri Rhode Island privateer Marlborough on the coast of Africa. First, let's look at European waters. While a number of continental na vessels were dispatched to European waters, including continental frigates Providence and Boston, the activities of which are covered extensively in Volume 12, there were two Continental Navy captains who did the most to forward this strategy of American presence in European waters. They were Gustavus Cunningham and John Paul Jones. I think you've probably heard of the latter. I wonder if you've heard of the former. <clears throat> between May 1778, I'm sorry, between May 1777 and May 1778, Gustavus Cunningham in the Continental Navy Cutter Revenge captured 24 British vessels, including six in the spring of 1778. These captures are detailed in Volume 12. Thanks to the onslaught on British commerce by Cunningham and others in European waters, British maritime insurance rates increased to 28% of the value of the cargo, higher than at any time during the Seven Years' War. It's little wonder that the pirate, and that's what the British called him, Cunningham became the most hated man in England. Another, more famous Continental Navy captain who brought the fight to the British was John Paul Jones. While the battle between Jones's Bonhomme Richard and the British ship Serapis is the one Americans know best, Jones's 28-day voyage in the Sloop of War Ranger in the spring of 1778 probably had more impact on the British public opinion and the conduct of the war. Sailing from Brest, go back, Carol. For that one. Sailing from Brest, and you can see the the outline of his uh, of his voyage there. Jones and the Ranger cruised the Irish Sea, captured and destroyed British merchantmen and the British Navy ship Drake, and most notably executed a land raid against the northern British coastal town of Whitehaven, and an estate at Kirkcupri. Where John, near where Jones had grown up. Jones tried unsuccessfully to burn some 200 merchant ships lying aground at Whitehaven. And at Kirkcubri, he attempted to capture the Earl of Selkirk, who Jones believed was an important peer who could be exchanged for a great number of American seamen captured and languishing in British prisons and prison hulks without any possibility of exchange. While the attempted arson was thwarted and the Earl was away from home and probably not important enough to command the kind of exchange that Jones envisioned, the fact that Jones and his crew landed on British soil twice and escaped demonstrated the vulnerability of English coastal towns. Or as Jones put it in his after action report, what was done is sufficient to show that not all their boasted navy can protect their own coasts, and that the scenes of distress which they have occasioned in America may soon be brought to their doors. 
The raid provoked a firestorm of criticism of the Admiralty. It is something strange and worthy of particular notice that at a time when the ministry are boasting of their invincible fleet, which they have fitted out, which is now r riding at spithead, that a little American privateer, oh, the British never considered our, a Continental Navy to be a true Navy. They always considered them to be privateers or pirates. Uh, you know, they never afforded our officers any, uh, any recognition. Only plunder and ravage the coasts of this kingdom, but fight to take His Majesty's sloops of war. It is a particular particular plague of the present time to rely upon appearances and neglect realities to put the nation to a vast expense and to do little or nothing for it. And that's from a British newspaper. Such fears concerning the vulnerability of England strengthened the hand of those who argued that greater resources should be committed to defend the home island, which was the goal of American planners when they committed the Continental Navy to this risky strategy. Finally, the raid strengthened the perception in Europe that the young republic might actually survive. According to a neutral Italian observer, the raid, quote, quote, caused a sensation in Europe and especially France because it again confirmed the opinion that the American sea forces are vigorous. Thus, I think it can safely be argued that the actions of Cunningham and especially Jones when paired with the entry of the French into the war was a game changer. Now, the coast of Africa was another area on the periphery in which the American revolutionaries enjoyed success in, the early, in early 1778. The crews of the Rhode Island privateer Marlborough, which is documented in great detail in Volume 12, illustrates how American op privateers operated in those distant waters. Testimony in Parliament in February 1778, which is included in Volume 7, analyzed the effect of the war on the British African trade. Before the war, some 200 ships were engaged in the trade, but by 1778, that number had been reduced to 40, and 15 of those ships had been taken by American privateers. Although most American privateers cruised for, sale, for slave ships near Barbados, which meant they could take the cargoes, and because of its proximity to the American coast, it would lessen the possibility of recapture. A few, like Marlborough, operated directly on the African coast. And it should come as no surprise that a Rhode Island privateer would choose to operate in African waters since Rhode Islanders had actively engaged in the African slave trade before the war and were familiar with those waters. While there's no record, that Marlborough's captain, George Waite Babcock, sailed on slaving voyages, his employer, John Brown of Providence, had been involved in that trade his entire life. Marlborough was a 250-ton ship mounting 20 carriage guns and navigated by a crew of 125. It sailed from New Bedford a few days before the New Year, and Volume 12 picks up its story off the Cape Verde Islands. The crew sailed east, to the French trading post of Guri, and then southward along the Guinea coast toward the English trading settlement of Ile de Lo. En route at, and at Ile de Lo, Marlborough captured five vessels, persuaded a British master to act as a pilot, negotiated a mutually beneficial deal with a local tribal leader, and burned the settlement at Ile de Lo when the British factors there refused to surrender the English property they held. The climax of the cruise cape uh, came off Cape Messerado, and let me quote the log concerning that incident. Quote, there came a canoe from shore with a black king called Robin Gray, steering for Montserrado when we hear of a slave ship all slaved, ready to sail for the West Indies. All sail set running southeast by east with our fleet after us. At 2 p.m. we made sail to anchor under the land, all hands getting ready to engage if needed. At 5 p.m. we came up with the ship at anchor. The captain ordered them to strike their colors, which they immediately did. At the same time, running under their stern. If you get behind a sailing ship, the stern is the weakest part. So if you put a, a, a broadside into the stern, you really destroy a ship, a sailing ship in those days. Captain, uh, this prize proved to be the Liverpool. Letter of Mark 
I'm sorry, this prize proved to be the Liverpool letter of Mark ship Fancy, Captain William Allenson mounting 16 guns with a cargo of 300 slaves as well as ivory and rice. A very lucrative prize. After missing a second slaver that he had intelligence of, Babcock decided to return to North America, but obviously not before having dealt a heavy blow to the English African slave trade. Finally, and this is not unique to the spring of 1778, volume 12 illustrates that attitudes among sailors in the Continental Navy were becoming more volatile, and they were exercising more control or more agency in their situation. By law, a naval captain's authority was awesome, and the tools he could wield to enforce his will aboard a ship were formidable. But documentation in Volume 12 illustrates the other side of the coin. Sailors were now powerless and could influence matters far more than one would think, given the imbalance of power, at least on paper, between the officers and the enlisted. Recruiting skilled sailors was such a struggle that officers had to accept seamen of dubious loyalty and to frequently to accommodate their wishes in order to keep them content and dissuade them from resistance, desertion, and mutiny. Both John Paul Jones and Gustavus Cunningham gave in to demands of their men and allowed actions which neither officer believed was legitimate. When Jones discovered that the Earl Skelkirk wasn't home, he wanted to leave the estate unmolested but gave in to his men's insistence that they repay the British for their destructive raids in America by allowing them to loot the estate. In the end, he got his men to agree to only take the family silver. This cost Jones personally, since he later felt it necessary for his honor to repurchase the silver from his men and return it to the Countess of Selkirk. And there's an interesting exchange of letters back and forth, uh, most of which the British Post Office wouldn't refuse to deliver. <laughs> Similarly, Cunningham allowed his men to seize British goods found in a neutral vessel. Even though Continental, the Continental Congress had determined to follow the rule practiced by France that free ships, in other words, a neutral ship, makes those goods neutral. This capture, therefore, caused major problems for Cunningham and angered Americans, al America's allies. Continental Navy captains also put their enterprises at risk by signing on seamen whose loyalty were neither to them nor even to the United States. In Volume 12, for instance, when he came into conflict with his principal lieutenant, Thomas Simpson, John Paul Jones found that most of the crew, which were recruited from Simpson's hometown of Portsmouth, sided with Simpson against Jones. In another instance, one of the Rangers' crews, a member of the party sent to burn that shipping at Whitehaven, the 200 ships I told you about, decided that this was his chance to return to Ireland, which was his native land, and he deserted and alerted the townspeople, thus limiting the damage the raiders could do. In another instance, recounted in Volume 12, Captain Samuel Tucker of the Continental Frigate Boston narrowly escaped death by the timely discovery and suppression of a plot aboard his vessel. As Boston was completing its refit in Bordeaux, France, two or three Englishmen who lived in the city hatched a plot to seize the frigate and sail it to England. The plan was for these Englishmen to sign on as seamen and joined by disaffected crewmen already on board and a few deserters who would pretend repentance and return to the frigate to seize the ship. To ensure the success of the mutiny, however, the plotters wanted to uh, neutralize the Marines on board. This they sought to do by discussing or negotiating with the Marine sergeant, Jerome Cazeneuve, a Frenchman. Cazeneuve played along and then later informed Tucker. The plan was diabolical and included adding opium to the drinking water to drug the crew and the officers the latter of which were to be murdered. Cazeneuve denounced the schemers, and although, although the ringleaders eventually escaped. Ironically, Cazeneuve himself later successfully petitioned French authorities for release from his enlistment, claiming that he had been ill-treated. Thus, in the months covered by Volume 12, 
these two short months, we have globalization of the war, a redirection of English war efforts, the devastation of the Continental Navy, a move to the periphery of the United States, the emergence of New York as a center of loyalist privateering, and what remained of the Continental Navy projecting power into, continent, uh, into European waters, and finally, the devastation of the British slave trade. I hope that you'll agree with me that Volume 12 does evidence a sea change in the way the American Revolution Naval War was fought. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, sir, in the back. The British were occupying. Um, what happens is Destang, after he misses the British in the Delaware Capes, goes up and he sits outside of New York until early August. Because, and then he decides, well, uh, he, tr he tries to get uh, attack New York, which is where uh, Howe's fleet was. However, his ships were too big to go over the Sandy Hook bar, or at least that's what uh, he says, that's what American pilots told him, and he said he offered a hundred a hundred uh, Louis in, in gold for any pilot that could get him in. So when they say, oh, we can't go into New York Harbor, and how it actually put his, anchored his uh, ships in a, in a bow right at the hook. And so as uh, DeSang had to f uh, sail in, he would have been blasted by Howe's ships. Be because the only way they could probably get those big ships, like the Languedoc, 110 guns, would be to take the guns out and then sail it in and then put the guns back in. So it, it didn't work. So instead of that, they decided to go against Newport. And that's the Rhode Island campaign. So they, come, they sail up here and they are supposed to join an army which has been forma uh, formed under John Sullivan, General John Sullivan. Sullivan was putting together militia and then there were some Continentals from the, the Northern Command and also Lafayette came up with a, a, some reinforcements. So they put together this force and the idea is that they are going to invade and capture uh, Newport. Well, the British really thought this was going to happen. They, they were outgunned. The French sailed right by them uh, up into the bay and, were, and so the British actually scuttled, destroyed, burned, uh, or sank most of the ships up here at Newport. And it was the greatest military disaster that the French suffered in the uh, American Revolution because they scuttled so many of their ships. But what happened is Howe was able to get his ships uh, back in service. He sailed out of New York. He came up to Newport. The Stang saw him, decided, I want to fight him. He sailed out to battle uh, uh, how and a hurricane hit. And DeStang's fleet was far worse hit than, uh, than Howe's. So what happened is a lot of DeStang's ships were demasted. They took some pounding from British ships because they couldn't maneuver at times. And so what happened is after the end of the battle, even though Howe uh, sailed back toward New York, DeStang goes to Sullivan and says, look, I, I, I can't fight. And, and Sullivan was b berserk. I mean, he, he wrote some letters that probably could have ended the alliance. But so what happened is DeStang went up to Boston and, and he refitted. So that was the end of the invasion. Now, as the Americans are pulling back, and Nathaniel Green's here, by the way, as the Americans are pulling back, the British chase them. And at the further northern tip of the, the island, the Americans get behind some, um, get behind some fortifications, uh, I mean, you know, temporary trenches type thing, and they, they inflict a pretty uh, heavy toll on the British, particularly uh, Hessians. And so what happens is the British then retreat back down to the southern part of the island, hold on to Newport. Destang is, spends his time in Boston refitting, and he has orders that at a certain time, at, when the s season is over in America, he has to f sail down to the West Indies, which is what he does. And the British decide they're not going to hold on to Newport, so they, they evacuate Newport uh, at the end of that, this year. So, yeah, I mean, uh, DeStang probably, had, they, had he not sailed out for the, the Howe, but he was afraid Howe might somehow attack his ships as they were piecemeal around the island supporting American operations. But, um, yeah, it looked like the Newport uh, garrison was, was dead meat, uh, in a sense, uh, at that point in time. But, you know, for a stroke of fate. 
And who knows, maybe Howe would have defeated him anyway. Howe is one of the great British uh, admirals. I mean, he later on during the Napoleonic or, uh, era, he's the one, he, you know, he predates Nelson with one of the great victories as well. So he was a good naval commander. Um, so he may have defeated De Stang anyway. Who, kno who knows? But uh, the, certainly the hurricane made a huge difference. <laughs> yeah. Did Howe have a brother? Who was yes, that? Howe had a brother. And that's, the, his brother was just about going home. I mean, uh, literally, he was about to sail from home. Uh, he had been the, the army commander in America, and he had been replaced. Uh, you know, depending on who you listen to, he had requested it, he'd been, you know, he, or he'd been yanked back because he hadn't uh, achieved what he wanted. So right before this period, uh, uh, William Howe had gone home, and, uh, and Clinton, Henry Clinton, was now commander-in-chief of the British forces in America. But he did no better than Howe had done, so, you know, uh, uh, they, they really didn't. The army, the British army in, its, in America didn't cover itself with glory, that's for sure. <clears throat> yes, sir? John Paul Jones? You mean after the war? Well, I mean, he continued to, uh, then after this raid of the Ranger, he goes back to France and he's expecting to get a good vessel. You know, uh, give me a fast vessel that, and I'll sail into harm's way, one of his famous quotes. Um, he, but he didn't get it. Uh, the Americans couldn't come up with the money and things fell through. So he got that old East Indiaman, the Bonhomme Richard. He, again, he sailed uh, with the idea of uh, attacking the British Baltic fleet. The British got most of their naval stores, masts, spars, those kinds of things from the Baltic. They had cut most of the good wood in, Ameri or in England itself, so that's where they got their wood. Well, he was going to intercept the Baltic fleet and do some damage. Well, he did, but it was, it was escorted by a, a new heavy frigate, uh, well, sh small ship of the line, heavy frigate, take your pick, uh, the Serapis. And that's the famous battle between Serapis, or, or sometimes called, we call it Serapis, you know, it's, it's dependent on how you, and Bonhomme Richard. Bonhomme Richard won the battle but sank afterwards. Green had, or Jones had to limp back into Europe. And thereafter, uh, the British watch him very closely and he never gets another ship. So after the war, he wants to be the first American admiral and he agitates. Uh, he has some people in Congress that w he works with. He doesn't get it. So he goes and actually goes to work for the, the Tsarina of Russia, Catherine. He gets involved in court politics. He actually wins, probably wins a battle for them, a naval battle against uh, the Turks, but, he, but he's outmaneuvered politically. He gets charged with um, <laughs> statutory rape. <laughs> it, was a, it was a setup, probably, uh, you know, and so he has to leave. And so he spends his time in France, and then finally, uh, when he, he's in a rather difficult uh, financial situation, the Americans give him a, a, a mission to go and collect some money that we said was owed to him, but he died. I mean, he was in, in failing health, and, that's, and then he was buried there, and his, you know, we didn't know where for years, and it's only when Teddy Roosevelt comes in to, pr to be president, the ambassador to France, the American ambassador of France, rediscovers his grave, and that's when they dig him up bring them back to America and create that sarcophagus. If you've ever been to the Naval Academy, gone down below the chapel, you see that. That's based on Napoleon's, by the way. Uh, you know, it's very grandiose, very spectacular. But uh, Teddy Roosevelt wanted to, you know, he, he was the Navy president. He wanted the Navy to be glorified. And so this was one way of doing it. C coming up with our great early American hero and bringing him back in, in uh, you know, real uh, majesty back to America. And then they had this wonderful ceremony putting him at the Naval Academy. So that's the story of John Paul Jones. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of good biographies on, on Jones. Uh, let's see. Uh, I always forget his name. Uh, I, I, it, it'll come to me. Talk to me afterwards. Okay, I'll give it to you. <laughs> okay, any other? Yes, sir. He was regarded as the father of the American Navy. Yeah, even though he's not American. You know, he's, he's a Scot. Uh, his name is John Paul. And what he did is right before the war, he killed a sailor. He said it was mutiny, but he skipped out, came to America. He had a brother who was a, a tailor in Fredericksburg, Virginia. That's how he ended up here. Mm. And then he, he made some connections, maybe through his Masonic, he was a Mason, through his connections, he made some uh, connections with some of the, uh, some of the congressmen, and he got, a, he got a commission as a lieutenant on the flagship, the Alfred, under Isaac Hopkins, a Rhode Islander. 
Um, and so that's how he started out. Now, he made a mistake. He probably should have taken a command of a smaller vessel, and he later said that. But uh, he thought he would learn more by sailing under on the flagship. Uh, and, then, and then from there, he took command of the Ranger, uh, I'm sorry, the Sloop Providence, and he ravaged, uh, he captured uh, an, a lot of uh, British commerce up in and around Nova Scotia. He was one of the first to make the raids up there. And so that established his reputation. And after that, excuse me, he had a couple of guys, including Robert Morris, who was in his corner. And so that's, you know, that's the development. And from there, he, went to, he was sent to Europe with the idea that he would uh, do some damage. And he did. I mean, he was, he was a good fighting captain. Uh, he didn't, in both cases, but particularly when he was in charge of the Bonhomme Richard, how he ran his squadron was a disaster. I mean, he really could have used some training on how to, uh, how to run more than one ship. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, <laughs> he, he ended up uh, supposedly he was shot on by his own uh, by uh, one of his own captains, but you know that's another that's another matter. Uh, uh, but anyway, he didn't he didn't manage the flotilla well, but he could fight a ship. Uh, I, I mean, Bonhomme Richard, it got so bad that literally the British could not fire on it anymore because they'd blown holes so wide that they, their balls weren't hitting anything. So they were jacking them up or jacking them down, trying to hit something. And they said, literally, you could have ridden or you could have drove a carriage, uh, what is it, a two by, uh, two by hand, you know, big carriage through the sides of the Bonhomme Richard. There were so many ha uh, holes. But he kept, he kept them, and also, I should say, in the first part of the battle, his big guns had blown up of themselves because this happened a lot of times on, on guns of inferior quality. They blew up and his, his, main, uh, his main cannon, his biggest cannon, were put out of action. So he went into the battle with, with you know, far inferior to the Serapis, which was a noob vessel and was very strong. Now, you know, they won, luckily. What happened is one of his sailors literally climbed out over and dropped the 18th century equivalent of a grenade it happened to bounce down, went into the gun deck of the British, and the, the boys that had been carrying up the powder, the gunpowder, had been stacking them instead of, you're only supposed to bring it up, but they decided that, you know, okay, we'll, we'll have them, you know, have lots of powder here for the guys, and they had stacked it, and that grenade happened to land right near the powder, boom, and literally it took out the Serapis's gun deck. I mean, it was horrific. It either killed or burned, you know, third degree burns 90% of the body type, uh, the whole gun deck. So really the, the, uh, um, the captain of the Serapis had nothing left to fight with, and so that's when he surrendered. So, you know, both, both ships were in, in really tough shape after that battle. Yes, sir? Uh, ships being superior in speed because they had copper bottoms. Yeah, although the, the British are starting to copper their bottoms as well. So, but uh, early on, the French had developed the technology of putting copper on the bottom, which uh, saves the, the process of fouling. So they, they would uh, work. Now, so the British were doing some of that with, with some of theirs as well. So they, they had, uh, it wasn't as great an advantage. And um, what the British, I think the British were the better navy because their tactics in battle were to get broadsides as fast as possible into the side of the ship. The French liked to shoot at the rigging and the spars and the, and the masts, and they tried to essentially, uh, you know, kill a ship so it couldn't move anymore. But it's harder to hit those kinds of things. I mean, you can cut up the rigging, et cetera, but the British, also the, the rapidity of fire that the British uh, crews were able to generate was, was impressive. And so they tended, in a one-on-one in -on -one battle with the French, they tended to win. Um, uh, you know, not always. I mean, you, you sometimes would have a French frigate captain who could, who could take out a couple of British. Now, I, interestingly enough, the Americans were probably the equals of the British in terms of fighting capacity. Uh, so when you talk, I mean, our, our ships were always so much smaller, usually, but that's what happened in the War of 1812. We build super frigates, you know, like the USS Constitution up here in Boston. And so what we do is we, you know, we take out any ship, British ship equivalent or smaller, and we run away from the big ones, you know, the ships of the line. And so the Admiralty actually issued orders to its captain, do not engage the American frigates one-on-one. -on -one. You have to have two or more of you. Uh, and so that's, you know, 
Now, and then they got smart, and then they blockaded us, so we couldn't get them out anymore. But uh, you know, that was so. That's in that case. My point is that the American crews were probably every bit as good as the English. Uh, oftentimes, they were made up of you know they were deserter uh, English deserters as well. So yeah, we 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 were good sailors. Everybody admired us, even though they called us pirates and privateers. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, a lot of that difference. Uh, as I understand, it had to do with the way the sailors are managed by the different countries. I mean, uh, the British were were uh, put in uh, were very oppressed as far as their sailors were concerned. They they were in in the sense that once you were on a ship, you didn't get off. Um, yeah, uh, you had uh, you were there for a long time. Yeah, there was, but uh, the British sailors um, were nationalistic and patriotic enough that they they. They didn't have many issues. I mean, you know, when they could run, they probably would. But you don't have major mutinies, except at Spithead uh, that one time. And that was, I mean, what you had the whole fleet say, hey, we're not getting paid. Our people, you know, our wives and children are starving. And so that was, you know, that was kind of a labor strike, if you would. Um, but in terms of, uh, in terms of, you know, in a battle, if they saw an American, would they, you know, say, oh, no, we're going to join the Americans? No, they didn't do that. They, they, they fought, uh, and they fought well, usually. And against the French, I mean, one of the things that happens when Destain goes up to Boston is there's what is called the bread riots. And actually some Bostonians attack French bakers and kill two officers. That could have been the end of the, um, the alliance as well. They, uh, sh they you know, said that it was British sympathizers and privateers and, and ex-British. That's how they covered it up. But the evidence is probably no. It was a, it was a bread riot. People in Boston, it was a bad time, inflation. Food was scarce, and they saw the British. I mean, saw, saw the French bakers, and there was probably a, a set to language if issues, but n no. And anti-French uh, act, anti-French feelings on the part of New Englanders, uh, and in France. I mean, in England uh, itself, uh, they they didn't like the French, and so that's almost a constant. Yes, sir. When did Rochambeau and his troops get into Newport? You said Stang went to Boston uh, and never came back to Newport. No, after the after the uh, British evacuated late 1779, Stang. I mean, I'm sorry, Rochambeau comes in 1780. Uh, so if you go to Providence, Providence, if you go to Camp Street, that's where that's essentially where they they and then you know they, they did the the march all the way down to Yorktown. Uh, Washington wanted them to attack New York. Washington had a bugaboo in his, because he always wanted to attack New York. And even his uh, subordinate generals would say, George, you yeah. know. Well, they didn't say George, they say General Washington, you know. You know. <laughs> but, uh, but Rochambeau said, no, that's too hard a nut to crack. And, and besides that, the French fleet would only come as far north as Virginia Capes. And so that's why they decided to do Yorktown. Worked anyway. I mean, after they took out another army, the, the, the British were tired of war, and so they just said, you know, okay, that's enough. We, we don't care enough about these colonies. The other thing to remember about the American Revolution, and people don't realize this, that's the start of the great British Empire. The second British Empire, the one on which the sun never set. They picked up Cape Town, South Africa. They picked up a, lot of ch a big chunk of territory in India, and they also picked up some territory in, uh, the, in the West China. Indies. Uh, so that's, that war became a, a, a world war, and the British did very well in the end. So, you know, they, they lost the American colonies, but in, in the day of mercantilism, you don't care because they produce the same thing the Brits do anyway. Uh, and what they did is they picked up some lands in tropical areas that were, they considered to be much more valuable. So, I, you know, it's a, it's a, you can debate whether the British actually lost that war. <coughs> yes, sir. Islands, yes. Oh, definitely. Uh, as I as I pointed out here, the British had decided to shift their strategy all completely. Uh, they essentially wrote off North America. I mean, they were going to what we called Vietnamese the war. Uh, they were going to use the locals to fight their battles. Uh, and so what they did is the yeah the focus of British activity, naval and milit and army was going to be in the West Indian Islands. Yeah, yes, you're right. Correct. I'm sorry. 
Yeah, well, the Spanish weren't in the war yet, but yeah, they had a, the, the French had a whole series in the Windward Islands that they, but actually they traded back and forth. And in the end, I don't, neither side got a real advantage uh, as to what happened up there. Uh, yes, sir. The Masonic Temple in Warren, Rhode Island, uh, was constructed from four of the vessels sunk in Newport. Oh, really? Okay. Well, the, the Green family uh, took one of them, the Flora, and uh, Griffin Green, who was Nathaniel Green's cousin, got a, the encyclopedia of Denis Diderot, who was one of the French philosophs, and he saw a way of how to float using um, bags, inflated bags. He floated the flora back up to the surface, and the Green family then went broke trying to <laughs> refit it out and make a, a killing with it. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was, and Nathaniel was very proud of him, you know, the, the, to use, and we actually, you can see Dennis Casanova's, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, his encyclopedia, and you can see actually what uh, Griffin Green used and how he did with bellows and, and inflatable things to raise the flora out of Newport Harbor. So yeah. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions? Good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You've been a great audience.